Raw, guess what? It's episode four for sure. So exciting. I'm going to be talking about today, Heather, love blossoming in a school environment. And I actually think school is better than Tinder. Which way do you swipe for like? Which way are you swiping for us? <laughs> well, I'm going to get you thinking about Jesus holding a gun to that loved one's head, Jane. Oh dear, it's going to be a bit dark. Uh, we're going to be meeting somebody who's an expert on LGBT plus inclusive schools and making sure children feel safe and seen and not just children, but everybody being authentically themselves and we're going to round things off with a little bit of hot under the collar poetry it's going to get steamy Jimmy. oh i like it it's all the all this all this love down the school corridor and in so stock cupboards. whip off your blankets let's get started <laughs> <laughs> some glorious gratitude for us this week oh well i have i'll tell you what's been bringing me the zinging sort of thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah a bit tenuous um do you know what i'm seeing more regularly and a little bit more often on my travels you know as i'm you know boofing around the m25 or whatever visiting schools um there's actually a lot of love out there and wow. i'm seeing head teachers who are married to librarians you know year three <laughs> teachers who were dating the ta in you know the uh i'm trying to think of the insert class name you know what i mean the badger class or whatever and you know there's a a fiance you know caretaker going out with the deputy or whatever and um it's it, it's making me think you know what came first the chicken or the egg, you know, was, was it, you know, um, we are teachers who are falling in love with other teachers because we get it and we're here late and we understand all the acronyms like PPA and ECT and we get it. And there's so many things we don't have to talk about in terms of the culture and the climate of a school or yeah. is it, everyone's leaving in droves oh my goodness we need a somebody yeah i'll get my boyfriend to do a pgce we need <laughs> teachers <laughs> get him in the building get him in the building so yeah i don't know what way it's going but it's it is adorable um you've got to be careful what you say about others which i am all the time of course but it of then course. made me think um you know, if it was sort of school grown, you know, and, and happening in the school, like what is what is flirting in a school when there are 30 kids watching? You know, is that awkward? Oh, That's what it up. is. Awkward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be careful. It's all I'm saying out there, people, if there's some little <laughs> romantic connection brewing. Could you, but, you uh, know, if you're could on... you pass me the print yeah. stick, please? Yeah, <laughs> please. Well, yeah, all of that. Um, you know, or you know that job sometimes you have to do. Well, you have to get on playground duty, which I'd always forget, of course. But you know, like you're going to bring out the coffee to the people on playground duty. You know, and you really think about the Tupperware cup and the lid. You know, and the delivery. You know, yeah. something could happen there, couldn't it? Maybe or. You're staying late to mark independent writing. You've got to discuss whether it's greater depth. There could be a bit of double entendre there, maybe. I don't know. Or the one thing in schools I never had and um, Pam always had, you know, that only a certain type of teacher would have this, that tool that you can remove staples with. Oh, yeah. What what's that called? A staple remover. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think it's you pretty see? simple. So we'd one. be 
Yeah, well, we'd be flirting with each other, wouldn't we? Because I'd need to bring down my display at a rate of knots. You'd have a stapler remover. And in that moment, that's where the magic happens. So, uh, yeah. The th thing with staples is, though, Jane, I think teachers fall on two sides. There's the happy stapler who just bangs them in, doesn't care, wax loads of staples in and thinks whoever has to take that display down can deal with it, not me. Um, yeah. Or there's the teacher is very careful and, you know, yeah. puts something in so you don't even push the the wall staple. It doesn't even go right <laughs> in. So it's easy. And they <laughs> and they barely put any in. And before they start, they completely staple remove. So it's a blank canvas. I, you I float think... with me, Heather, because I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, think I know which two happening. sides we fall in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely so yeah but that is adorable just there is a lot of there is a lot of like early romancing or you know donkey's years of marriage and i think it is probably i don't know if it's boring or easier to be married to a teacher god knows i mean maybe uh, email us or heather email heather please heather at <laughs> the teacher squad podcast because i went dot co dot uk i won't reply dot com, will, so, dot com you idiot <laughs> who's in charge <laughs> oh, i think Lord. i think you, you you want a bit of an idea there though jane you know the way you know you've got like Anton Dubeck writing not and Shirley Ballas writing novels, you know, set in their yeah. world that they understand. Maybe yeah. your next, you know, your next goal Mills and Boone yeah. is to write a novel for teachers, you know, fifty shades yes. of whiteboard pen. Swap um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because you're not that busy. You're you know, you could you could no. push that out. Yeah, absolutely. My, you know, on you know, in a premiere in, that'll get me in the mood, surely. <laughs> they always provide a little uh, bit of writing paper and a pen, don't they? That's what it's for, Jen. Jen, I just made a yeah. new name up for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's my other uh, that's my other other woman. <laughs> Dear. I hope we're not recording anyway. This is going down like a lead balloon. Oh my I was God. just going to say, don't worry, Jane, I'm very faithful, but that might go off on yeah. a uh, traitor's tangent and I haven't watched it, so we'll <laughs> leave that where it is. Shall I tell you what I'm grateful for? Yeah, will you? Mine's very simple this week because we've had a birthday in our house. The lovely Luna Bluebell, our cock-adorable, cock dog, has turned to in the last week oh. uh she is cock adorable and we're just we're, as a family we are very grateful for her and the cuddles that she gives and she's very uh, dogs are very astute to how you're feeling and she's great when my daughter's feeling a bit you know wobbly or any of us actually um and yeah. she, you know she's there to kind of comfort and and love you and i I, I'm, we're very grateful for that and I think it made me think about school dogs I'm a big fan of school dogs do you see many yes. when you go on your travels you do actually more and more and I think primary schools are very very good at the school dog um and then um you know there's some that just come to visit and there's some that practically live in schools actually who are just kind of around and about helping out all the time but yeah. great companions or uh, a listening ear to children who want to read and like to yeah. hang around libraries, of course. Uh, so, yeah, I do see a lot of, of yeah, actually no, some I... really um, very handsome and pretty dogs on my travels. Yeah, very photogenic. Uh, it's just start taking selfies with them, Jane. <laughs> yeah, I know. But you know how I care about my clothes quite a lot as well. So <laughs> take, a, take a lint roller with you. Take a lint roller. <laughs> I don't care. I just just cuddle in because me, I'm not very fashionable, am I, Jane? So you know, it doesn't really well, matter. You know. I get dog hair on my uh, on my clothing. <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad you've forgiven me from last week. Anyway, that's the main thing. Oh, I'll always forgive you, Jane, but I'll never forgive. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, So um, yeah, I've um, 
been um, actually it's been really wonderful my uh, time this week. I've done a lot of teaching, and um, and actually a lot of the schools I've been working with um, lately, we've been trying to slim down guidance. Like we're a bit sort of got so much to do. Yeah. Um, where shall we attach our thinking? And it kind of reminded me that um, there are some things that are really useful out there. And um, I think the time of year that it came, uh, kind of uh, just kind of schools opening post COVID, a lot going on. Uh, I think a lot of English subject leaders kn know about it, but actually haven't had a lot of time to connect with it and I just wanted to um, give a shout out actually for um, the reading framework by the DFE. Now we've had it for a while uh, but I think it's a really solid document and um, <sighs> bedtime reading, I, well, yeah, it's quite a bit of a heavy one for bedtime but at the back I think the, there's such a good close um, bibliography actually and it's that that I think is the most interesting thing about the reading framework uh, and it's a sort of uh, document that I keep returning to and kind of going on a bit of a kind of a, a, a trail with some of the research papers that are locked in there um, but one of the things that you know, it's quite hard to read this. There's a quote in the reading framework by uh, Stahl and McKenna that says, and this is about, um, you know, our role as teachers, as readers. It talks about, um, I'm, going to, I'm quoting here, generally labels serve to excuse our failures to teach reading by blaming the students for their failure. Rather, we should accept that some children are harder to teach and we need to work harder to reach these children. And um, I've been thinking about that ever such a lot because, yeah, you know, and I suppose I'm, I'm leading into kind of sum up in a sentence here, Heather, that, yeah, some children are harder to teach. Um, you know, in fact, I was teaching this week and uh, there was lots of bribery about, well, when Mrs. C comes to teach you, you might get a dojo if your behavior's like this. And, you know, within, you know, one minute after this child was getting stabbed with a pencil in his thigh, he said a naughty <laughs> word. He went, I'm not getting a dojo now, miss. I'm on Mrs. Considine. I'm like, well, probably not. That's quite <laughs> a naughty word. <laughs> but, um, Was it on the PG yeah, list? You know, <laughs> no, not even on the PG list, Heather, actually. No, definitely not <laughs> getting a dojo. No, no, definitely not a dojo moment. Uh, and so, yeah, some kids are harder to teach and, and some kids are harder to reach. But in terms of reading... This is when we've got to uh, really step up, don't we, and, and curate and consider what they need next to be readers, you yeah. know. And it, it, it's 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 not easy. And I, and I just and as well, there's a there's a little phrase locked in that reading framework um, that I think is really important that I want to grow into something. I'm not really sure what that is, but they, they talk a lot about reading miles. And um, when I when I grew up in Birmingham and I was um, uh, went to secondary school, it was a massive thing called the um, BRMB. It was like a local Brummy radio station. They did the BRMB walkathon, which I think was like eleven miles round the kind of ring road. It might have been more, but I don't know. Why I'm, I'm just like fairly certain it was eleven miles around the edge of Birmingham city centre. And you kind of get your teenage gang and you knew who you were walking with and you'd have some, you know, crappy trainers on and you'd you'd be singing all the, you know, latest songs in the in the top 40. Um, and um, it was a really important part, kind of year in, year out, kind of a big sponsored walk and um, a really big part of my teenage years actually and it's and kind of that reading miles just made me think of that you know and actually what would 11 miles be of reading and what what would you be reading and is that like the top 40 hit parade and what would you work <laughs> through and 
<laughs> who'd make it and who wouldn't make it. Um, but yeah, it's, um, you know, how, how do we um, switch children on to start their, their own journeys with reading and how far can they go? And, um, and again, that reading framework for me is, it isn't mentioned once. You know, there's about 12 references within the reading framework about all the science uh, around rereading that actually children need a chance to read it and read it again and again. And even though our reading brains can get there much quicker, you know, kids, kids need a chance to contemplate, you know, and, um, and uh, you know, w what is the best reading? Well, we know it's deep, it's close, it's yeah. attentive, and that, you know, so much in schools is at a pace and at a pelt. And actually, a lot of what we've got to do with reading is like, rewind, let's read that again, <laughs> and rewind. And um, all of that. I've got images um, of you with a big ghetto blaster on your shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that actually was me on the BRMB walkathon, got to say. Uh, but, yeah, you know, and we've got a model. You know, there's lots of things there. We've got a model reading aloud, and then we've got to reread it again, and they've got to read it aloud, and then we've got to help them read it aloud, and we've got to model. We've got to model the model that's in our brains. You know, like, what is the mental model you've got by reading this? And I'm going to model my model. And there's so much modeling going on. Uh, and, and, then, <laughs> and then and then the bell goes. <laughs> yeah. And like you've modeled enough. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think we, we, everything's just a bit too fast, isn't it? We kind of qu want yeah. quick gratification, quick everything. And, yeah, more of the slow. And that comes from yeah. releasing the pressure from the top, I guess and endorsing yeah. the the slow and understanding that the value comes from that it's sometimes we seek too much quickly and actually we get more yeah we go yeah slower i agree with that and in many ways it is a bit like um the the, the fast the gratification you know what we don't actually it's not the the affair it's not the quick it's not the instant actually we've got to read like a marriage don't we it's really slow and really long <laughs> and the rewards down the line honest keep going <laughs> way down the line <laughs> ah, yeah, it's one of them uh, you talk about yeah. your marriage quite often jane i do worry yeah i know i know no <laughs> We're fine. No, honestly, we're fine. <laughs> oh, he's listening. Dear. I know he's listening. Oh, bless. He's good. So he's Heather good. is a good boy. Ten out of ten. Have Have you got things you've been thinking about this week on your mind? Yeah, can you it sum kind it up? Runs along with what you were thinking, actually. So my my sentence is: the children are evidence informed two and this is a bit of kind of reframing how we are planning lessons or you know experiences in school sometime and maybe shifting from that thinking about the progress of skill or the progress of knowledge but yeah. actually the progress of belief so you were talking yeah. about some of those pupils who harder to reach harder to teach and for all yeah. kinds of reasons um yeah. people's come to school with different beliefs about who they are what they can achieve what what they can be this this train of thought has come from listening to um the diary of a ceo by stephen bartlett have you seen that book yes um, 33 yeah, yeah. laws of business and life so this thinking and i I like listening to or, you know, finding out about other bits of research that are not necessarily education based and seeing how we can bring them into play. And this is about chapter four. And the law is you do not get to choose what you believe. 
and he kind of rightly says that some people shudder at that and kind of go i, I you know i can choose what i believe but then he talks yeah. about this um scenario and says i want you to imagine uh somebody that you really really love and at this yeah. moment in time they are held at gunpoint by a terrorist and they say i will release them and not hurt them if you tell me that you believe i'm jesus now mm. in that moment you cannot make yourself believe that that person is jesus can you at best you can lie and then he goes on to say well if we say to them well if that person then changed water into wine before you would you then be able to tell you know to believe and that piece of evidence that witness changes things and talks about factors for change in belief and it's about what a person's current evidence is in their mind the confidence yeah. that they have in that current evidence from all the breadth of experience that you know we've talked about pupils that bring to school the new yeah. piece of evidence that they have and the confidence in that new evidence now we're familiar with confirmation bias though actually we're quite good at looking for things that reaffirm what we already believe um but if we look for we talk about look for the good look for the bad don't we you know if we, it affirms yeah. what we already believe so a child who thinks they are bad at reading thinks they are bad at maths they're going to be looking for things that confirm that oh, i can't do i can't do they're going to be looking but actually our brains are more astute to things that um are what we want to believe we will take that piece of evidence on. Um, so if we really want to be good at football, if somebody says nice pass, you'll, you know, it'll boost you up and you yeah. will absolutely. And top to bottom of it, really what Stephen says is that to, to move forward in a belief, because we can change beliefs, but it's done by evidence, is about moving from the comfort zone into the growth zone. Not into the panic zone. Yeah. That's where negative yeah. negative evidence comes. This growth zone where new evidence can be there. So as teachers, I was thinking, how can we really think about providing those evidence moments? We might think about our class. Hopefully people who are listening now will be able to think of pupils in their class and say, I, as a teacher, know that they can be a great reader but they don't yeah. believe it. And it doesn't matter how many times I say you can be a great reader, that isn't going to shift their belief. So what can we do to safely push them into that growth zone, give them an experience that will garner them some positive evidence that they can start to build up so that they turn around and go, oh, actually, I, I am a reader. Actually, I am good at math. So, you know, maybe some little tweaks can have impact, you know, for those pupils. You yeah, know, yeah. I'm going to just come, I, just uh, a school in Grimsby uh, that I was working in. We were doing um, a lot uh, around sort of uh, live diagnostic assessments of ch children in a real hour of time and um, and what I was trying to demonstrate there was at the live point of teaching writing that actually rather than going uh, well done I like this sentence that kind of very vocally um sharply and quickly diagnosing something very quickly and saying um actually that precise choice of that verb there strolled has created this sort of atmosphere you've you've done a really good job there in your writerly choices so that you're actually a little bit more um a kind of real and evidence-based life in that moment and then some of your live marking advice you know it's like when you're listening to children that you can say right i really liked your 
you know, two alliterative words there with the same sound. Can you give me another one sort of uh, levered into that sentence so that it's it's quicker but very evidence-based? And um, I, th I think these things that, are, as you say, put them into a, a space not just of growth but they feel with you that there's this sort of strong relationship you know, it's not pretend, it is, it's not twee, it's not Mary Poppins. I mean, I can't be a bit Mary Poppins if I want to, but it's, <laughs> it's just that, it's that sense. It's real and it's, and it's not, um, it's not vague. And I think that's part of that growth. It's, it's what we get, we get told as parents, you know, like catch them being good. You know, it's, it's, it's that, isn't it? But with, I think as a, a teacher's job is a little bit more specific yeah. and precise. And then the kids can believe it when you go, look, yeah. no, actually you've done that. Not me. That's good. The evidence is there. And it's about providing that space, isn't it? And, and being deliberate in your planning and going, I know that they can have success. That's what you're doing, aren't you? Giving them the opportunity yeah. to be successful and then yeah. catching the success so that they can note it and build their evidence bank to yes. say that they are a capable writer. Yeah. They are yeah. creating the ideas. Yeah. It, yeah. That, yeah. So it's kind of a, a, a thought, you know, piece. I like this it. Week to kind of get people kind of thinking, because we can get into that very samey, this is how I plan and look at the objective and this is what we do next. Da, da, yeah. Da, da. yeah. You know, and actually, you know, they are all individuals in front of us. They come from very different places, um, and we're, 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 we're growing the, the child as, as a person, aren't they? And, and, you know, if we can just yes. take sometimes a little moment in our fast, you know, quick lives, just the slow of going, actually, is that right for their? Can I help them believe that they are? And then the skills yes. and the knowledge can can grow a little bit quicker, can't they? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's, um, it's, it's, you know, children really do um, appreciate that's, uh, you know, the specificness of um, that sort of evidence, what, the, what you're saying about evidence, you know, and it's, it's that fine line, isn't it? Because we want to uh, reward effort, not necessarily kind of outcome you know, effort, we need to really, really notice effort. And we've got to make sure that we're in that noticing of effort that we don't overload them. Because it's very easy, isn't it, to suddenly for kids to feel overloaded and, and they give up. So, yeah, yeah. there are a lot going on in their little brains, haven't they, in their little lives. So. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've got a great guest to join us today, Jane. Um, so yes. we've got Joe Brassington joining us. Uh, they are an educator, speaker and author who work with schools, universities, charities and businesses to support them to create spaces which are more emotionally honest, equitable and inclusive for all people. They specialise in creating LGBT plus inclusive spaces. So it will be great to invite them in and chat a bit more about that. So Brilliant. Shall, we, shall we get them in? Hi Jo, welcome to the Teacher Squad podcast. We are really delighted to have you with us here today. Um, I wanted to just ask you, so Pride and Progress that you have created with Dr. Adam, you work on creating an LGBT plus inclusive learning environment. Just tell us what, what does that involve? What does that look like? Hmm. Yeah, I, I think when we talk about diversity, equity and inclusion in any way, and um, today we're talking about LGBT inclusive spaces, it's important that we position that as part of a wider body of work around inclusion. Um, so making LGBT inclusive spaces is actually really similar to making educational spaces that are inclusive for all people. In our mm. book, we, we recommend this kind of common inclusion goal in schools. And what it says is that we want our schools to be a place where people feel free to be themselves, feel safe, seen, supported, and feel like they belong. And I work in lots of schools with lots of teachers, and I'm yet to come across a teacher who says, no, Joe, I don't want my classroom to be safe. I don't want children to feel like they belong. <laughs> of course we want those things. Um, but so often we don't name them. 
And if we don't name them, then we run the risk of them not necessarily being true for all people. So I think by naming that common inclusion goal and thinking about what that looks like for all people in a holistic way, and then specifically for LGBT people, um, and, and then working from there, really. And when we talk about educational spaces that are inclusive for LGBT people. We're talking about students and children, young people. We're also talking about colleagues and staff, how to make sure our, our educational spaces are inclusive for LGBT colleagues, but also wider community, LGBT families that are part of our school community as well. It's, um, I think it's quite a, I want it to be a holistic conversation that talks about all of those kind of key um, stakeholders in our educational spaces, but also positions LGBT inclusion as part of a more holistic piece about making our schools more inclusive and equitable for all people. Yeah, great. And Joe, um, when you talk about environments and space, um, it, how how um, creative does that get? You know, um, you know, is it? Is it actual physical space? Is it time? Is it resources? I mean, I'm just trying to visualize it. I mean, I think in terms of um, kind of ethically, you're right, like all of our teachers' minds are going to be there, but kind of practically, what does that become? What is that as kind of, kind of a, a lived sort of experience for both uh, teachers and the community? Great question, because we can all talk about the the value of inclusion, but actually, what does that look like in practice? How do we make that real? Um, we, we have this model, which uh, I use in, in my work with schools. It kind of came about in our research for the book, and we call it the pillars of an inclusive educational space. And it might be useful for me to talk through that to kind of talk about practically what it looks like. So, so if you imagine this model, um, it's got a, a base which is built up of two things. Right at the, at the bottom of the base is empathy and understanding. Yeah. So before we can begin to develop inclusion in our educational spaces, we have to have empathy with people who are different to us and an understanding of what kind of differences we might be talking about. So that empathy and understanding is the key starting point. Just on top of that is policy and procedure. So our inclusive spaces have to be built on a base of, of empathy, understanding and policy and procedure. And then on top of that, we have four pillars of inclusive education. And it's my opinion that if we can have these four pillars firmly in place, then we can build an educational space that is inclusive and, and robust. But if we have any one or all of them not firmly in place, then we run the risk of that inclusion falling down or, or not being secure. So the four pillars of inclusive education in the model that I'm describing. The first one is that common inclusion goal. I've just told you the one that we recommend. I encourage every school teacher to name what their goal is for inclusion. And you'll notice the goal that I said, it, it didn't mention LGBT community. It's about the inclusion of all people. Everyone should feel free to be themselves, safe, seen, supported, and feel like they belong. And name that goal out loud. Name it in policies. Have a display that shows it. The more everyone in your community can know and be familiar with that goal, then the more likely it is that we're going to be able to work towards that as a whole school approach to inclusion. The second pillar of inclusive schools in this model that I'm describing is a common inclusive language. When we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, when we talk about LGBT inclusion specifically, there's a lot of language that people are sometimes unfamiliar with. And we have to develop a common understanding of what all these words mean in order for us to have meaningful conversations about, about what they mean in our schools. So that's the first two, the common inclusion goal and then a common inclusive language. The next pillar of this inclusive um, schools model is curriculum. And that's about how we consciously construct our curriculum in a way which represents the diversity of our society. And really what that's talking about is the fourth um, pillar of inclusive schools, which is representation and visibility in our schools. Mm -hmm. and so often um, I have conversations where people say, yeah, having, um, having good LGBT representation is really important for the LGBT young children in our schools, but actually, 
that pillar of representation is equally as important for people who don't identify as part of that group yeah. because we all deserve to see ourselves represented in our learning spaces and in our curriculum but it's actually equally as important that we see people who aren't like us and build empathy and understanding of different communities too so that that model i hope helps to kind of make it a little bit more practical a bit more real that that firm base of empathy understanding and policy and procedure and then the four pillars of inclusive education a common inclusive goal common inclusive language curriculum and visibility and representation yeah and um when you joe you talk about common inclusive language when when i mean like we're fascinated by words uh on this podcast and we're just constantly talking about words and when words are right and when words can go wrong um what when you talk about that what do you mean by um sort of good practice with inclusive language i mean i, I think i can guess but i think practical examples of when it goes right uh, are really useful to our listeners mm, so one of the questions that often i get asked in schools is around when we should be introducing the language around LGBT community. Um, because it is true that when we talk about LGBT communities, there is a lot of language that is some of it new, some of it developing, and often it's unfamiliar with a lot of people, for a lot of people. Um, I think it's really important for me to make the distinction there though, that um, the language being used within the LGBT community for people to meaningfully and accurately talk about their identity and their experience of the world, that is, is new and it is in some ways developing. But one of the common misunderstandings there is that these identities or these people are therefore new. And I, I think whenever we talk about language, we have to make that distinction that um, the people and these experiences have always existed. We're just now finding new words to more accurately and meaningfully talk about them. But that can feel overwhelming for some people. And I, I, I find myself encouraging teachers a lot in, in to, say, to say to them, it is okay for you to not know what all of these words mean because any definition that I give to you, I too have had to learn at some point. We're all on this journey of kind of learning together to how to how to make our spaces more inclusive and our language more inclusive. So be curious with it. And I think if we can bring together our curiosity and our compassion, then we can find a way to discover what this language means for different people and how that's going to impact our practice in schools. Yeah. Yeah, what really good point. What kind of barriers and difficulties do you find then if uh, you're invited to work with a school? maybe by senior leadership but, but do you do you have any issues with other staff um bringing them on board i believe that one of the biggest barriers to creating lgbt inclusive schools is that um it's, it's linked to the history related to this so um section 28 which some of uh, some people listening will be very familiar with that language for some people they may be hearing it for the first time section 28 was an amendment to the local government act that was made in 1988 by the conservative government at the time and what that amendment said was it prohibited local authorities and it was then assumed schools most of which were under local authority control were prohibited from and the language of the act said promoting the acceptability of homosexuality or promoting homosexuality and that that language is quite shocking for us to hear now the idea that we were prohibited from promoting acceptability and what section 28 did is it created this kind of silence in our schools and that silence became shame because we didn't talk about this community these identities these people people built a shame around conversations related to that and the reason i bring that history up is because section 28 was in place from 1988 until 2003 when it was fully repealed across wow. the uk that's 15 years and the majority of teachers working in our schools certainly the majority of leaders leading our schools were educated themselves during that period of time where there was yeah. a silence surrounding these kind of conversations and that silence built up a, a level of shame and i suppose the the legacy of that history is that we now have 
so many teachers, so many leaders who aren't really sure what they can and can't say because they haven't got a blueprint for that. They didn't grow up themselves in an inclusive educational space or a school yeah. system where conversations were usualized. So when we ask people to imagine an LGBT inclusive school, what we're really asking is for them to reimagine what our mm. schools can look mm. like, reimagine yeah. what classrooms can look like. And actually that is difficult. And that's one of the biggest barriers that we face because when we have conversations like this, what we're asking people to do is to learn while simultaneously unlearn. And that's a real challenge. I, yeah. I, I think yeah. about, um, I'm, I'm gonna, this might be a, a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a curveball. You might not expect me to finish a sentence like this, but there's this YouTube video that I think about, which has this cyclist and he's an amazing cyclist um, and has cycled his whole life. And then on this YouTube video, he gets on a bike where the handlebars have been reversed. So when he turns left, the bike turns right. And when he turns right, the bike turns left. And it takes him ages to relearn how to ride this bike because he's having to learn and unlearn at the same time. And I think that's one of the biggest barriers that we face in school, that we are actually asking people to completely reimagine mm. the kind of conversations and the kind of spaces that we can create because they haven't always existed in the past. Mm. And Joe, if you went to school during that time of, um, you know, Section 28, and then you went to a Catholic school as well, that's a lot of, that's a bit of double unlearning, I think, uh, maybe uh, people have to do. <laughs> yeah, that, I'm talking about my life there, by the way. <laughs> oh, dear. It's true yeah. though, isn't it? Joe, you, yeah. you shared um, a post in the last few days on your ex twitter account and uh, I, th I think they're four years apart uh two mm -hmm. photographs of yourself uh looking a little bit different and the 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 latter one looks like it's authentically you and you've talked about being people being feeling free to be themselves you obviously felt called to share that um do you want to talk to us a little bit about that? And maybe there will be some teachers listening who feel maybe like four years ago, you who were not quite being true to themselves and that they might find this inspiring or, you know, useful. Yeah, I think when I joined the teaching profession, which was a while ago now, I had only ever seen certain types of people be teachers. And actually, I'd only ever seen certain types of people be successful or be professionals. So when I joined the teaching profession, I tried to fit that mold. And what that meant for me is that I went to school and lied quite often about a lot of different things and the different parts of myself. I tried to present what I thought I had to be. I suppose this almost... Um, more palatable version of, of who I actually was. And there was there was a period of time where I would go home after school and kind of unfold and feel more authentic, more free. And then I would fold myself back up again to go back into school. And if we imagine that as, as kind of a piece of paper, a colleague of mine, Claire Birkenshaw, talked about this, this idea that there's only so many times we can fold and unfold before that fold becomes like a tear or a rip. And there's only so many times that we can ask someone to pretend to be someone they're not before that starts to be damaging for them. And I think it's around this concept of professionalism and, and what, a, what a professional looks like. Because I, I believe that all of our teachers should be professionals. It's hugely important that they are. But so many of these standards of what a professional should look like or sound like are rooted in this history of a system that kept some people in and some people out. Yeah. So we need to challenge that and talk about actually, what can a teacher look like? What can a, um, a being a teacher look like? And I think we need to be encouraging, particularly our um, early career teachers to kind of draw those professional boundaries for themselves. I think they're, they're entering into a profession where they their, their identity as a person, their self, is now going to come and intersect with, intersect 
intersect with their identity as a professional, both their staff room identity, but also their classroom identity, which can vary at times as well. And I think all teachers should be able to draw those professional lines for themselves. How much of themselves do they want to bring to work? Because, you know, I work with LGBT teachers who don't want to be out at work and that's fine. That's perfectly professional. That's a decision they're able to make. But if another LGBT teacher in the school up the road wants to be out in their classroom, that's also professional and fine. And I think we need to encourage our teachers to draw those lines for themselves and think about how much of themselves they want to bring into their professional identity. Yeah. So what would your piece of advice be for a teacher who is maybe not a new teacher, but you know, maybe feels like they'd like to be more authentic in school, but they've created this character, I suppose. It's a bit of a character, isn't it? A bit of a charade that you put on. What, how, how can they move forward in that? Is it a big change? Is it small steps? Or does it really depend on, on the person? I think the, the first thing you've got to do is make those decisions for yourself. Actually, at the, by the end of this year or in a year's time, what do I want myself to look like in this profession? What do I want the classroom me, the staff room me, the professional me to look like? How much of myself do I want to be able to bring into that space? And once you've made that decision for yourself, and, and like I said, if, if you don't want to share any of those things in, yeah. in, in school, that's fine. Um, there's no obligation for you to. But if you do feel like you want to, it's important for you, then you are you should be enabled and empowered to do that. So think about those small changes, certainly, um, because those small things can build up. I remember um, the first time that I went into my classroom, um, I, I always paint my nails. And as a child, I used to steal nail polish from my sister's magazines and paint my nails and then remove it before I went to school because I knew that that, that shouldn't, then there was a shame around that existing outside of my bedroom. Um, and now as a teacher, um, as an adult, that's part of my life again. Um, and I'm really, I'm really glad that I get to express myself in that way. But the first time I did that in my classroom, I drove to school so nervous thinking, what, what are the children in my class going to say? What are the parents going to say? What are the teachers going to say? And actually, one of the parents just said, love your nails. And one of the children <laughs> said, yeah, they look great. And no one else mentioned it. These small steps that we big up in our mind are, are, as huge things so often don't end up looking like that in reality. So take those small steps, be that little bit braver um, yeah. and slowly um, become or confident in bringing yourself to work and remember that um every person if we're trying to create educational spaces where every student and every young person is um free to be themselves sort supported safe seen and feels like they belong in that school that has to be true for our staff and for our colleagues yeah. as well yeah and i imagine that for your mental well-being it must be a, a a massive change and a you know so much better for you to not be folded up <laughs> yeah but also i mean yeah. that it's the, that individual lens in terms of it is better for me because i get to go into schools and be myself and i don't have to hide and lie and pretend to be someone i'm not that's that's a great thing for me but also it makes me a better teacher because I'm not spending so much of my energy trying to think about what I'm saying, how I look, what yeah. ch changing the pronouns when I talk about my partner so they don't realize that it's a man. You know, all those things that take up the energy mm. of our teachers could be better spent in them being good teachers. So as well as yeah. that kind of individual freedom, it also gives them so much professional freedom as well. And so much of being a good teacher is about relationships, isn't it? And if you're true to yourself, then that relationship with your f colleagues and the pupils is... It's going to be richer, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, well said. Oh, Joe, you've been wonderful. Um, if people want to work with you, if they want to uh, improve the place and space of their school and and uh, work on kind of being more authentic and supportive, where can they find you and seek your help? So I would encourage you to go to our organization website which is prideandprogress.co.uk on that website you can listen to over 50 podcast episodes where we interview lgbt teachers there's a short series right. of videos you can find links to buy our book and you can also find all of our contact details to get in touch there as well fantastic right. what's we'll your favorite nail color <laughs> 
We should have opened with that question, shouldn't we? I was my just going to say we'll favorite. put it in the show notes, but now tell us the important thing. Best my favourite nail colour is orange. I feel most myself when I have orange nails. Oh, bright Love and that. sunshiny. What about you, Jay? What's your favourite colour? Oh, I'm black, always black. Yeah. I like don't know heart. why. <laughs> <laughs> Cold bitch. Um, but mine, oh, natural, because I am very unfashionable, aren't I, Jay? Just saying, she said it, not me. Just I said, I'm just being authentically me, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, thanks Joey. Joe. It's been so good to speak to you. It's been a pleasure to join you both. Have a good evening. Take care. So, Heather, um, you know I've got well, well, I've had love on my mind a lot, noticing Ooh. all this sort of lovey-dovey stuff in schools. Um, I actually wanted to read you a poem, and you know we've talked about this a lot, haven't we? Like the the importance of knowledge to be a good reader. And then um, I found this poem that sort of brought the two things together. And this nice. uh, poem is written by Christine Webb, and um, Christine Webb was a teacher in the 1970s and um, she met and fell in love with her partner Jackie and they worked together at an all-girls school and uh, this is the poem uh, that captures the electric thrill of a new love and it's, um, it's kind of their shared knowledge and that sort of memory of what happened last night. And then they've got to be in school the next day. Oh, it's one of them. <laughs> it's a bit <laughs> saucy. I don't, oh. I think this is one for the adults. This is, if you, if you've just had a secret snog at a, a, of the Christmas stew and you've got a face in the next day, this is one of them. <laughs> Or you're starting to take out the, you know, the coffee on the playground. Right. It's called Knowledge. That moment suspended in the dull room above the streets of the January town, a branch pecked on the window, but the curtains shut out the garden of dead chrysanthemums, if you can say it, undressing for each other the first time all I saw was lit up by your body, its gold and ivory. Such knowledge to bring away, to carry wrapped through the streets, past naked trees, into the school where heating pipes clanked and gossips, where blackboards expressed decorous equations, where at the corners of corridors we might breathe in to pass each other but not speak or glance in case the doorways should break into leaf in case the books we carried should burst into flame oh, no. <laughs> keep it just, under wraps just fan it fanning myself there jade <laughs> Oh dear! Funny herself. Don't quote her out of context. Yeah, <laughs> it's just—it's a bit raunchy, isn't it? Knowledge. Yeah. Love that, Christine Webb. Um, yeah. yeah, and and they—they're uh, still together, and it was long and long and loving. You know, it's exciting. Yeah, yeah. Nice. yeah. Ooh, In fact, just... teachers who love teachers. It's it's um, yeah. It, there's a lot of it around. <laughs> oh, well, I'm coming right back down to picture books, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> back to the four-year-olds. <laughs> no raunch here today. Not <laughs> and um, I, was, I was thinking I'm going to share with you one of the picture books that has just gone out in our Reading Rocks teacher subscription. So I, was, the, I, did, I did hint at a bird book in the key stage one so oh i can't say we've got a swift oh. return in there and it's written by fiona mm. barker and illustrated by howard gray and uh do you ever look at the Good dedications in, in books yeah. and, and fiona's yeah. dedicated this one to everyone caring for the natural world and the air we share i thought 
thought that was that was Aww. really nice. And then the other yeah. one I've brought out is Shine Like the Stars. It's written by yeah. Anna Wilson and beautifully illustrated by Harry Woodgate. And I noticed the dedication in this one that Harry had written to Marion, Liz and Rebecca for great teachers are the true stars. Oh, oh how nice. Good. And I just thought I would let you know that I've had a book dedicated to me once, Jane. Isn't that nice? Oh, <laughs> that is wonderful. This, this no, one is good. It's, it's a Mermaid Academy book and it's written by Julie Sykes and Linda Chapman. And Julie is my friend. And this is what she wrote oh. in my dedication for Heather Wright, who puts the rock into reading. Oh, I, I actually, I actually believe that mermaids exist and that's that. And I'm not going to let anybody persuade me otherwise. I mean, surely they just exist. I will not push you out of your comfort zone and grow you with evidence. <laughs> you stay there in your belief yeah, it, that mermaids exist. Yeah, I'm with you. Swimming yes. around with the dolphins they are that I saw the other week. Anyway, let's jump into yes. this book, Shine Like the Stars. And um, it says on the back, reconnect with the natural world in this poetic and mindful picture book with illustrations from multi-award winning Harry Woodgate. And it, it just talks about I am the earth and connecting with the earth and the sun and the ocean and the seed and the sky and the moon and I'm going to read the bit that connects you with the stars. Yes. We are the stars. In daylight we hide waiting to shine. In the night we sparkle and twinkle and glisten. We have been here for millions of years. We came before clouds and the ocean, the birds and the seed. We came before you, we made you. When you feel small, look up at us. We belong here together in this vast universe. You can shine like us too. Sit with us, breathe with us, watch with us, be with us. We are the stars waiting to shine. You are part of this earth. You rise like the sun, you breathe like the ocean, you grow like the seed. Your moods change like the clouds, you light up like the moon, you shine like the stars. Oh, wow, the illustrations are great, aren't they? It's really high drama beautifully illustrated and then at the back it's got some kind of information snippets about kind of being grounded by the earth and a ray of sunshine it's beautifully put together beautifully written beautifully illustrated and that is why i chose it to go in the key stage one reading box subscription box yeah you're good at that heather yeah ah, you really are you have a whole plethora of books and you just know which ones are the winners yeah clever girl I like choosing what are you up to yes. this week jane are you busy busy round the world uh round the world yeah off here there and everywhere uh we're getting ready to go to birmingham for a right stuff conference soon so if you want to save your seat uh go to janeconstantine.com and book your place um yeah that's exciting uh it's always good to uh go back home to uh, be able to speak in my proper accent or I was going to say do, all of that do you bring ass. it out <laughs> well you do <laughs> within a minute after speaking to people with a brummy accent it all happens so yeah oh, yeah yeah uh, exciting stuff what are you doing yeah what have we got going on well I've got this ECT course coming up for uh, early career teachers thinking about reading for pleasure in their classroom so doing some work on that thinking about our pupil premium book packages at the moment and um, doing a little bit of mentoring for some authors thinking about how to make their school Ooh. visits absolutely banging so always Ooh. busy Jane so we better say goodbye yeah. haven't we yeah banging and busting all of that jazz love it 
<laughs> well, uh, I've had, uh, as always, uh, a lovely uh, crashing together with you. I'm glad you're not wrapped up in a blanket. I think, you know, it's a bit <laughs> of a, you're taking the layers off slowly as February uh, comes upon us. Uh, so, uh, always a pleasure, Heather. And I know it's big love from, from Heather. You. From me. Yeah, and uh, we'll have some heart bursts from, from her. From, from Jane. See you next week. <laughs> See you, everyone.